For Those Who Are Politically Wise, a show about the lives of Christians in Ohio involved with politics. Introducing your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Greetings, my fellow patriots, saints, and sinners. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. At the end of the show, there will be a blessing. Don't miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Do you pray for a politician? Do you think a politician can be a Christian? Do you think a politician should stand up for Christian principles? Do you think politicians should pray together? Do you want to see more Christians in politics? If you said yes to any of these questions, please join the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network. Find the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network on Facebook. Welcome back to Politically Wise. The opinions and statements on this show belong to those who give them. The rest of the show belongs to Thomas Wise Words, all rights reserved. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Hello, my listeners. This is Reverend Thomas Wise. The show is called Politically Wise. I have a very, very, very special set of shows for you. My guest for the next couple of shows is a missionary to the people of North Korea. Due to his security concerns, I will only address him by his code name. For his protection and the safety of his mission, you will only know my guest by the name of Chart, C-H-A-R-T. Let me tell you the story of how I became acquainted with a missionary known as Chart. Many of my listeners know that I am an associate pastor at Valley View Church in Inglewood, Ohio. I lead a small men's group Bible study on Tuesday nights, have done so for years. On the road where the church is located, there are only five churches in a five-mile stretch of road. But on Tuesday nights, Valley View Church is the only one of those churches with cars in the parking lot. One Tuesday night this past summer, during one of our normal men's small group Bible studies, which we have in the kitchen just off the back door of the church, there was a knock on the back door. In walks a twentyish white male, saying, Hi, I saw the cars in the parking lot, and I'm wondering, will you pray for me? Of course, I said, but there, is there something special we can pray with you for? The young man replies, I am a missionary to the people of North Korea, and I am looking for churches who will pray for me. I reply back, We can do that. Have a seat. For the next couple of hours, my men of my men's group ministered to this young man with prayers, questions, and encouraging Bible verses. A great deal of that time, we sat there listening to this missionary share about his mission to the people of North Korea. Chart shared about God using him to demonstrate God's love in a practical way to the people of North Korea. He talked about his latest trip and how God had placed a love burden in him for the souls of the people of North Korea. He talked about the danger. He talked about the politics involved. He had just gotten back to the USA from his latest trip and was believing that God wanted him to get ready to go back to North Korea. The missionary was currently seeking churches to cover him with prayer. Never once did Chart ask for money, just prayers. After that night, Chart and I stayed connected. Now you will hear the fruit of that connection. Today we'll broadcast 
part of an interview of an hour-long conversation that I had with Chart. The whole interview can be heard on my YouTube channel, Politically Wise. And we will be right back after the break. Hello, my listeners. This is Reverend Thomas Wise. I need your help. I'm putting together a show about political jokes. If you have a favorite political joke that you can share with me, please call my studio phone number, 937-634-9473. That's 937-634-9473. Or email it to politically.wise at gmail.com. Here's an example of what I'm looking for. What's the difference between a magician and a politician? The magician gives your wallet back at the end of the performance. I'm not saying politicians are not trustworthy, but instead of giving a politician the keys to a city, maybe we'd be better off to change the locks. If you have a good joke, call my studio phone number, 937-634-9473. That's 937-634-9473. Or email it to politically.wise at gmail.com. Thank you. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Hello, my listeners. This is Reverend Thomas Wise, and the show is called Politically Wise. I have a very different interview today. My guest is a missionary called to the people of North Korea. And for security reasons, we will give his name as Chart, C-H-A-R-T. So, Chart, please tell my listeners about yourself. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for having me. So, a little bit about myself. I never know where to start uh, when people ask that question. But uh, I'll start when I was saved, uh, about 15 years old. Um, I grew up without a father, so I had kind of a difficult childhood on understanding what it was like to be a man. Um, So I struggled quite a bit, um, but I was one of those kids who uh, uh, was sent to the church camps uh, to give my single mom a break. Um, And uh, I went there a few years. Well, the third year I went there, I got saved, and um, I'll never forget that. And I knew after, uh, you know, I gave my life to the Lord, uh, I knew that from that moment, everything was going to be different. So I still struggled, uh, with my faith, like a lot of people do. Um, and, uh, I think I, I wanted to be, uh, in the world and still part of God's kingdom at the same time, but God shows you as you walk, uh, with him that that's not possible. And that sanctification continues to, uh, happen, uh, just day by day. And it continues to happen to this day. So, um, at 15 years old was kind of the start of that walk. And, um, you know, over the past, you know, uh, 13 years, it's just been, uh, daily, yearly growing closer to him. So, um, I didn't have anybody to show me intense discipleship, but I had a few men who God put in my life that showed me this strange love, uh, that was from God and it got me interested, uh, in it. So that's what kind of, uh, brought me to the church, you know, from the beginning and kind of curious about it. And then there's church camps, just kind of, I was the one normally causing chaos there, but um, they still loved on me and it was uh, a beautiful place to be. And then, you know, when you hear the gospel for the first time and really receive it and understand it, it's the most powerful thing that you've, you've ever heard and, and experienced. So um, that was the beginning. Um, so uh, I, uh, I, you know, grew up and tried to walk the best I could, but didn't seem like I did very well yielding to uh, the spirit. Well, I moved out when I was 18. Uh, I bought a house a year later. And uh, when I lived in this house, I um, I uh, I just kind of learned what it meant to walk with God. Um, I lived there alone, and I just kind of redid this house. I worked full-time, went to school full-time. 
And I didn't really know so much about who was talking to me all this time. And I, I just learned that this was my father in heaven that was talking to me. And I, I started to get a little glimpse into what it was to walk with him. Um, but I was still pursuing, uh, you know, a degree as a, a medical worker. I uh, have always uh, desired to be a holistic practitioner and treat the body as a whole and uh, get to the root of the issue. And um, I liked that spirituality was an aspect of that, that it wasn't apart from uh, how you're about. I worked in the medical field five years. Uh, I'm an RN and um, the foundations of my life shifted about uh, about three years ago um, when um, when God just wanted me to stop work and stop school and just pursue him. And uh, it came with a lot of confusion and wrestling and resistance, but God gave me the grace to set my, my life aside at, at what I thought would be just a temporary thing. And he took me through this journey of just me and him day by day. So I spent 10, uh, 10 months in kind of solitary time just seeking the Lord. And it was a time of just breaking and addressing sin and, um, and just thinking that was off in my mind of what uh, our relationship was supposed to look like. And uh, I was having a tough time, but it was still a beautiful process of refining. And so after that, um, God led me to a, a school um, in Texas that was a little discipleship school where he taught me a lot more about prayer and um, just taught me a lot more about the lost world and how they're still waiting to hear. And um, so uh, there was a lot of passion that grew from that. And uh, during that time is when God kind of started talking to me about uh, North Korea in this dialogue. Um, God speaks to me through dreams and visions. Not not many other people understand that, but uh, people who God does speak to them like that, they understand. And um, I can't always articulate it uh, as clear as I'd like to, because I have a difficult time, you know, even understanding it. But um, I know what's from God, and He makes it clear. So um, I just try to, uh, you know, uh, trust in Him and just try to walk by faith according to what, you know, um, He's shown me. So anyways, it's just been a beautiful process uh, of, um, you know, of breaking and growing closer to Christ and just walking uh, walking with him daily and learning what it is to pick up my cross and follow him and embrace suffering and um, and reach a, a lost world that doesn't know his name or his saving grace. So um, that was kind of the big change from, from three years ago, and God has just blown open the doors over the past year uh, when this time last year, you know, I didn't even know that people could live and work and be in North Korea freely as a Christian, as a foreigner. Um, but now that I spent the first five months there uh, of this year, um, I know the real situation there. So um, it's just a wonderful privilege I have to be a part of the handful of people that understand the way that country is firsthand from being there and working there and living with the people. And it was only by God's grace and God's hand that he got me there. And um, it was just a miraculous way that he did. And I couldn't have orchestrated it if I tried or had millions of dollars. It just all had a way as I did my best just to be completely surrendered to him and, and seeking his will and trying to be obedient to what he wanted me to do. So, um, yeah, it's just been an awesome journey of faith over the past, uh, you know, it's been over three years now. So Five months you spent in North Korea. What did the Lord have you do? <clears throat> well, it's kind of interesting. You know, we always think we understand the mind of God, but I think I think we're far from understanding his uh, his mind and his ways, and we just get a little glimpse into it when we really seek him with all of our heart and our mind and our strength, and and try to uh, fulfill that first and greatest commandment that he he desires from us in that personal, intimate relationship. But you know, he, uh, he the way he orchestrated it was actually I met someone divinely across the world, and I didn't I didn't know that I was going to be meeting this person. It was all just a uh, an appointment from the Lord, and um, they needed a veterinarian there. And uh, I'm not a veterinarian, but uh, God made it uh, happen to where I'm an RN, so I have a medical, you know, some medical understanding. And I had a farm for a short time, and a lot of people, and even myself, didn't really understand why I had this farm. But God taught me a lot through uh, those animals and taking care of them and stuff. And but anyways, He made it to where uh, I, on paper, was a veterinarian there. And I barely did anything with that. I mean, it was literally just a small little cookie crumb of what I did there. Um, otherwise, I would 
just be doing whatever I could to serve. You know, when I was headed overseas and I didn't know what exactly the Lord wanted me to do, but he said, go overseas and to this place and that's your next step. I didn't know any, you know, anyone's name or address. I didn't know what I'd be doing, but he knew and, uh, he orchestrated it perfectly. And, um, you know, I remember praying on my way overseas and all I did was, cause I didn't understand what was going to happen, but I just, I knew how God had been leading me for nine months prior. And I just prayed that he would let me live in that country and that he would let me serve however um, I could. And um, that's the way that he, he got me in. And I think that when you're willing to be clay and just be whatever he wants you to be and, and uh, you want to live to do his will and not your own, then I think he can use you. And I think that's really one of the greatest things that someone can do is offer their, them, their lives completely, whether they're uh, an architect or a plumber or, uh, you know, uh, working overseas or whatever they're doing, I think if they can dedicate themselves to the Lord, knowing that every moment of their life uh, should be dedicated to building His kingdom and not their own, then I think at that point, just by being available and willing what He wants you to do, then He can He can use you, um, you know, out of the outflow of your, your relationship. So I, sometimes I'd be helping build stuff, sometimes I'd be helping you know, the little ones with their homework or, you know, goofing off with them. Or sometimes I would be uh, working with the animals. Sometimes I'd be working out in the field. Sometimes I would be helping them uh, cook and learn how to cook for the foreigners. Um, But in all that, whether we were moving bricks around or planning stuff or whatever, I was always uh, looking for those opportunities to show about God's love and God's character um, and I think that should be all of our, our, our goals, knowing that's our real job uh, and the job that we have in this world is just a catalyst to be able to express the greatness of God. Like that's what he wants to do through us is he wants to show himself, um, you know, gracious and glorious and merciful. And a lot of that is how, you know, how, however situation that we're in and how we respond um, and wherever we're at. So, um, I was open to do whatever, but, um, I just served, uh, the, you know, the best I could doing whatever I could. Um, so how receptive was the North Korean people to the gospel? Um, that's kind of hard to gauge. You know, I think a lot like the United States, you know, uh, when you talk to people on the surface, people aren't real receptive. Uh, but there's a hunger and desperate, desire for truth and for love. So um, I wouldn't compare it exactly like Americans here, but uh, there's definitely a, a, a desperate longing in that country. They've been suppressed for so long um, that they, they're they to the point to where they're curious and they're open. So, uh, you know, you can talk about God there. It's still a delicate issue, but you're not going to get arrested for it. It's not tangible at least at this point, uh, when I was there, things change day to day. And I'm sure there's going to come a point where there's going to be persecution that increases. But, um, you know, they're very receptive. Uh, They're very receptive to uh, knowing about truth and and God's love. So you can talk to them about it and you can see that uh, that they're uh, hungry for it. Uh, As far as receptive, it's kind of hard to gauge because in that country, it comes at a high cost. If the government may even think that you have an interest in it, it, there's a really high cost to that to where you may be going to prison or you may get killed for your faith. So for them, it's hard for them to express it. You know, there's so many stories out now of refugees who have gotten out and they've talked about how they've held on to one page to survive. When you're in there, you don't know what information, what people know about, and you don't know if they're just kind of secret believers or not, because um, it's too dangerous for them to express it. So what I can tell you is that I know that God's faithful, He's good, and the church is, uh, you know, uh, rapidly growing. I can tell you that the church is very much alive and thriving there. Um, Now, whether I can see, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, you know, answer that, you know, like clearly, but I know that, that He's there, that God loves them, and that when you talk to them, they're very open about it. They might get a little uncomfortable and say they don't want to talk about it anymore. But, um, you know, in general, I think that they're much more open and receptive than your your average American. How can 
people pray for you? Well, right now, the way that people people could pray for me is just to continue to be led by the Spirit. Uh, they could pray that I wouldn't have fear. Uh, fear dominates that country, and anyone really involved in that country is going to be uh, challenged by uh, the enemy and uh, those spirits who like to put fear. Um, but God has a great plan for them, so they could pray against the uh, the spirit of uh, of fear, uh, and um, they could pray that um, that somehow I could learn the language from a local person. I, I mean, I care about learning the the language so I can communicate with people. But even more, I would love to be able to build a relationship uh, with those people uh, and whoever that person would be teaching that language to me in their dialect, I can build a relationship with. So people say it's impossible, but uh, praise the Lord, our God's in, in, in the business of doing impossible things. So um, I love to for people to be praying and believing, uh, you know, uh, for that. Um, I guess also, um, you know, whenever I go back, which is in about three weeks, I'm, I'm leaving a little bit later than I planned. Uh, but I wanted to come back here and leave with excellence, and I came back here to kind of raise support and share about what God was doing there and just been praying with my leaders. So I plan to leave at the end of December um, and head back over there. But um, when I get over there, they can just be praying that, um, you know, that I can show uh, love and I can serve and I can just be willing to uh, do whatever the Father wants, you know. Uh, I guess one thing I can mention is if anything ever happened to me, you know, I don't know so much about the uh, the will of God, you know, but I I know that his ways are far above my ways, and I don't always understand the way he works. But um, I would pray uh, or ask and request that people would be praying, if something ever happened to me, that they wouldn't be praying for uh, my release, that they would be praying for God's will to be done. You know, even Jesus himself uh, set his will aside to do the will of the Father, and even Paul talked about it being for his glory that he was in prison. And so I don't know if it's God's will. You know, I'm thankful that these guys have come back from America and they're with their families now. But for me, I would, I would ask that people would pray, uh, you know, for the Lord's will to be done and that they can pray that uh, God's grace would be enough to sustain me and that um, I could just be filled with his love and, um, and just be blessed by him to be able to bless others. And, um, lastly, I mean, it seems like an impossible prayer request, but even big things, they can be praying that I could maybe even meet the leader, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, who knows what can happen with people's big faith. But I think in general, people err on the side of, you know, praying these smaller things, uh, you know, that I feel like God is worthy of asking for much greater things. So, um, yeah, I mean, they can, they can pray for general, just the freedom of religion in that country to flow, that more people would hear God's word there. Um, you know, that the, the hearts of the leaders would change. Um, and just that, uh, the gospel would flow there. So, I mean, God answers prayer. Um, it, he's been uh, pursuing these people a long time and I'm excited to be a small little dusty part of burning away the darkness there. And I don't know what the future holds, but, um, I know that he's faithful and um, I'm just praying that he will uh, use me as I'm willing to uh, serve and uh, in love and um, just try to be open to whatever God wants me to do there. What are some ways you have demonstrated the gospel in a practical term to the people of North Korea? Um, well, it was kind of cool there. You know, I, I didn't know the language when I went over there, so there was a barrier, and you would think that would be a disadvantage, but for me, I recognize it as a huge part of God's plan that I didn't know the language. We couldn't influence each other, so we could only observe each other by our actions. And it was such a beautiful thing. It was like my life was silent, even though that I heard this language, you know, because I, it couldn't influence me, and they didn't really know English uh, either. So um, it was really neat. But, I mean, you would be surprised even in the United States how much you can just you know, show love to people and then know that something is different about you. Um, over there, it's, uh, it seems to be pretty easy because they all kind of have the same mindset and they're, they're, not, they're not used to um, anything, you know, close to God's love, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, it might sound funny, just that normal daily tasks, they can really tell a difference uh, in 
uh, you know, in the way that your attitude is with them and the way that you're just sharing joy. And um, so across the board, I've done it several different ways. I mean, I've directly verbally talked with people, um, whether it was through a translator or not about God. And that's where those conversations I'm talking about, that they are open to it. Um, I have um, done a lot to just show God's character in different situations, whether it be through an animal or through a circumstance of work, um, you know, and uh, I wouldn't say they're necessarily parables that I was talking about, but you can show a lot of God's character through explaining things and, and getting people to think about, oh, I've never thought about that, you know, and it's something simple, uh, you know, in love, but uh, it gives them new perspective. So, you know, the fact is, is we can't change anyone's heart, you know, only the Holy Spirit can do that. But uh, for some reason, God chooses to use us to be able to express his love through us. And um, when you can yield to the Spirit and let the Spirit live through you the way that Galatians 2.20 talks about, then beautiful things happen. And that's really all he's called us to do is to love. And he says the world will know that you're his disciple. So there's something very profound about this divine love when, uh, when you give it. And people should be able to see it as something drastically different from the world. And it really should be something that's desirable. Even if it comes with resistance, it should be something that they see as something they, they want. Whether they would admit it or not, I don't know. But, you know, so I know that's kind of vague. I mean, I could tell stories for, you know, hours on end. Uh, when I was over there, I'm hesitant to share some specifically just because of the work that goes on over there. And um, But, yeah, I mean, just, just like in the States, you know, when you have opportunity to just reach out and be gracious to people and, and, and love them, whether you're telling them directly about God's love or whether you're just showing it uh, and hoping that they recognize something different in you. And you know it's, it's Christ, but um, they might not be able to put your finger on it, but I'm finding out that there just there needs to be some some relationship established uh, a lot of the time. So I know that God can move in great ways without doing that, but it seems like just in general that God is very relational, and you can't just shove the gospel in people's face. Uh, especially nowadays, they really want to know if you're genuine or sincere about caring about them or or wanting to love them instead of feeling like a project. So. I've noticed that when you don't have an expectation, you can have the hope they might uh, come to know Jesus and, and, uh, and recognize his love and, and let him be the Lord of their life. Uh, but, you know, I've recognized that if you don't have the expectation uh, of just, besides just loving them, then it seems like the Holy Spirit just kind of does what he wants to do uh, and does the work in their heart. So I just realized that there's a trust aspect there. And when people really feel like you genuinely, sincerely care about them, which is a heart issue because people can sense it. They know. They know when you're, you, when you're striving or trying to do it in your own strength. And even worldly people can't directly say it, but they can feel it. But uh, there's a sincerity that comes when you don't judge people or you don't condemn people. And you're just sincerely meeting them where they're at and you're just loving them for who they are, just the way that God does us. And somehow there's a release and and spiritual strongholds are, are torn down, and there's, uh, there's a breakthrough, you know, and somehow they are more open to responding uh, after seeing this, this purity of love. Um, so it's going to take time, you know, over there. It's going to take patience. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. They've been through a lot in that country, you know. But this is the same way that people should be here in the United States as well. You know, they, uh, they should be willing to... to, to sincerely reach out to them. If people don't know their neighbors and they've never invited them to dinner, then you've heard people say, why would they come to church with you? You know, maybe they might, but if they don't know you, you know, then, and they haven't ever seen what you have to offer them this love that, that you're supposed to be showing them, then it is weird. Why would you go to church with some stranger, you know? So, you know, that, I think that's an important thing here or there or wherever else in the world is to truly just uh, love people and and meet, meet them where they're at and show them that you care about them and then let God take over from there. Can you share about the trees well, that you planted? So, yeah, I guess I could add that in as kind of a prayer request. You know, this is one of my prayer requests that I pray is that uh, people want to know what they can do. What can I do here just sitting, listening to this uh, right now for these for these 
uh, 24 million people that God would love so much that he died for and that he de- de- desperately desires to with and that he has a great plan for them. You know, they don't know so much what they can do, but sitting right here, the first thing they can do is is pray that they can sincerely have a love for them. And uh, for whether you're American or, or Korean, it would mean that you can ask God to give you that love because, you know, our flesh is strong and uh, you know, it's we 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 don't have that love in ourselves. It's God's love, so we need His help to be able to love, especially among the Korean people. There's a lot of fear there. Uh, there's still some bitterness, you know, there, and there they 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 a lot of them don't desire unity. That's not the case among all Koreans, but in general, um, that fear uh, really dominates a lot of Koreans. So those those Koreans need to desperately pray that God would break their hearts. Uh, and 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 sincerely have love for these people. Um, so, you know, I think that the first thing that people can do is is not spread fear, uh, not spread um, you know any kind of condemnation on these people, and instead they can have hope and they can have faith. And in conversation, that means you know, hey, God died for these people, and we should love them. And looking inward at our own hearts, what we can do here to love them. And uh, it's just putting your faith in knowing that God said he'll, he'll reach all nations, and this is included in that, and um, he's going to continue pursuing them. And uh, if you wanted to go beyond that, I think the first thing you could do uh, to show them that you care about them directly is just be there. Um, so it sounds like a drastic thing to do, but, you know, they can't leave that country, you know. And uh, when people come over there, uh, again, whether they would admit it or not, um, they really want you to be there. You know, they uh, they know that you care when you've come from an America and they've heard these myths and stories about America and they're wondering why you're there, but they know that you're there at least because you care about them, that you're interested in them. And, um, you know, they, they, they really, you can tell that they appreciate it and they want to honor you. So, you know, the story that you're talking about, uh, about 20 Americans came over there and playing the trees and uh you know i don't know if it's ever been done before but how profound with a country that has had so much difficulty with america that there's americans in this country planting trees on the mountainside that are are going to be a part of the livelihood of their entire culture you know it's not like here in america where you know we can drive around and get food or we have uh, all the resources we could ever want over there you know wood is a precious resource and uh, planting these trees was not only a symbolic symbol of sowing into the land, um, but uh, practically speaking, you're you're showing them that you love and care about them. You're spending your time, your money, your effort to come over there, plant a few of these little foot on the side of a mountain so they can grow and so their future generations can be uh, sustained, whether they're cooking, you know, uh, food in their houses or whether they're warming their, their homes. Um, it plays a big role in their culture. So it's just a small thing um, that have a huge impact. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that that was a really, really beautiful thing that, that happened. Do you have an example of anything else you can share? You know, I, I can probably give a few small examples that are secure enough for me to share. But, you know, there was a little dog over there that, you know, no none of them gave any attention to. They did everything but that, you know, and this dog was scared and just so timid. And, uh, you know, God has given me a special heart for animals and he's taught me so much, uh, through animals. And, um, this little dog, I just kind of started daily rehabilitating and, you know, how I rehabilitated him was, was, uh, just through what scripture talks about and just doing it with God's love. And that means spending time with them. It means being patient with them. Uh, it means gently correcting them, you know, and so I, I, uh, I just spent time with this dog and, uh, it completely to this day, I'm sure is, is changed. And, you know, when North Koreans observe that, they don't understand so about, you know, why someone would want to care about this life, you know, but, uh, there's times where they would ask about it and you can't deny the truth when it, sitting there right in front of you so they could see that there there's a strange love or connection in this relationship you know um so you know just little small things like that have a big impact on their heart you know just like you know when uh when we're lost and uh far from god you know at some point there 
there's some conviction that may come when you see someone care about someone else, show them love or show mercy or show grace or compassion in some way. It's character of God. It's not it's not our character as, as humans. So, um, you know, it's the same way over there. So that's one, you know, um, and just being able to give or, uh, you know, uh, spend time with people over there. So there were several situations where, you know, I went out of my way to be able to love on someone or bless someone. And that's God's character. You know, he, he blesses us, uh, uh, abundantly and he goes above and beyond and he just pours it out on us. So, um, I think that he, he wants us to be an extension of himself and, and, and let himself, you know, show himself glorious through us. So, um, it's, it's a lot through the small things, though. If someone interested in following your footsteps, what would you recommend? Um, well, it's interesting. The first thing that I would recommend that, uh, that I see now is that uh, someone has to have a really intimate relationship with the Father, you know, and I'm just learning about that. I still feel like a babe with it, but I'm realizing most of us in our daily lives, we don't put God as our first priority. And a lot of us think that's no fun and it's not worth it, but it, it's totally worth it. He is worthy um, to put as our top priority. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to have fun, uh, especially as a young person. That's the biggest lie from the enemy. Um, so I think that if someone wants to, to, uh, to, to be able to be useful to the Lord, I think it first comes through having that relationship uh, intimately with him. And then everything else kind of flows through that. So, um, I'm just learning that that's the greatest preparation. Um, and just having your heart where it should be, um, in advance, you know, uh, so he can, he can use you and, um, and so you can be ready because that's, what's going to sustain you when, uh, the whirlwind happens, uh, of life uh, around you. And if your if your relationship is solid, uh, with the Lord, and that's your joy, um, then uh, it doesn't matter what's going on externally in your environment. Um, he's your rock, and, um, you know, he's the one that you're going to be leaning on, and uh, that's all that you're going to desire, and um, that's going to be what sustains you. So um, I'm just learning more about that. Um, I would, you know, there's something I've been wanting to say, I guess, openly, especially to young people, um, and this might make a lot of parents upset, but You know, if we really believe the time is short and our lives are just a small little, uh, you know, vapor uh, in this life, then I really wish that a a lot more um, young people and parents would be on the same page for living for his kingdom. I don't think that it doesn't mean that you can't go to college. So I want to clarify that up front. But um, I think that there's a lot of people, uh, you know, that are being disobedient. Uh, by being in college, uh, but as but there's also people who are, and vice versa. So, I mean, I just I just wish I would hear more people say that they prayed and and God said that they should be in college instead of it being a good idea or just something that our culture uh, or what is you know uh, kind of a part of our society. You go to college and you get a good job and have a happy family and that's what you're supposed to do because um, we're a part of a different kingdom and. Um, you know, as much as it makes sense, I just wish that would take it seriously, um, their call to be good wives uh, and good mothers and to raise up a, another generation. Uh, same thing with men. That would be good husbands and good fathers to raise up another generation. But we don't take so much time to, you know, even in the, a lot of the church, we don't uh, consider those things. We put much more investment in going to college and making sure that we can secure ourselves and like I said, I, I'm not making this a bash against college, but um, I I see a lot of Christians, it seems like, try to do both, and it doesn't really work out really well because uh, they go to college, they do all these things, they put their time and effort and, and money into these things, and then later on it seems like, you know, they try to do both, but they never really were letting the Spirit be their teacher and how to be a good mother and how to be a good wife. And then a lot of them either lose out completely on it and God uses them where they're at, even though, you know, they, they wish they could be married or have kids or they get into that relationship and they're just not prepared. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but it just, I wish I would see more young people be sold out for Christ uh, and 
wouldn't just live by the world standards of, you know, what makes sense to, you know, go to college and then find a job. And, you know, if God wants you to do that, praise the Lord, like you're doing that for him. But a lot of people do it, uh, especially in the church, say, oh, I'm going to get this job for God so I can do this and that, which sounds really close to, you know, oh, God wants me to do this for his glory. But they're two different things. One is doing it in your own strength, so you think you can do something for God, but when you get to that point, you end up getting wrapped up in yourself and your own life and, you know, caught up in the world. But, you know, if you're focused on God, then, uh, and he told you to do it, then he's going to keep you through that. So um, it was cool during this discipleship school. I felt like I was behind the game almost 10 years. It was uh, young adults in there, 18, 19, 20 years old, who right after high school, um, they gave the first year year of their life to the to the Lord, and I thought for a young person that's the number one thing that someone could do uh, is you know you have a whole lifetime ahead of you, and if they can if they can give one year to the Lord, isn't He worthy of that? And you lay a small foundation to just give a little time to the Lord to let Him speak to you and show you what He wants to do with your life. And hey, if He wants you to college, go for it, and then glorify Him when you're done with that, um, or you know, maybe he'll continue to want you to go in ministry without college, which doesn't mean you're any less valuable. Uh, a lot of the disciples, they didn't go to college, you know, but they were with Jesus, and uh, God used them to change the world because they were with him, and they, they, they learned from him. And ultimately, I think when we just yield to his spirit and, and want to live as hungry as Jesus was to do the will, we're the ones who are blessed. We're the ones who get the joy from that. And he wants us to have joy in him that way. Um, and that's what I think brings the most glory to the father. So that's probably my number one challenge, uh, is that someone would get into discipleship school. Uh, I don't know. Same thing with seminary. A lot of people just jump in seminary. Uh, and, uh, I don't know if that is there. I think in the same situation, there's a lot of people who, uh, are, shouldn't be in it. And a lot of people that should, but, uh, I think that God should be the one to tell you to do that. But these discipleship schools are, are really cool because, um, you know, I hate to admit it, but a lot of the church, we just lack discipleship. It just kind of, we go to church every Sunday and then, you know, we maybe do an extra Bible study and, uh, you know, say hello a little bit after church. But, you know, uh, with uh, Jesus' command and heart in Matthew 28, when he said, go and make disciples of all nations, you know, we should all have someone that is above us, that's discipling us, and we should all have at least one person below us that we're discipling, even if we're only one month, you know, uh, young with knowing the Lord, you know, that's what discipleship is. And that's what transforms the hearts of men and, and, you know, people's lives and families and nations. So, you know, I would challenge young people to give that first year of their life to the Lord and just put it off one year. It's not going to kill them, you know, and God will honor it as you lay a foundation for your life and let him have one year of your life to show you what he wants to do with the rest. Um, you know, so that that's my one challenge. They're, they're all over the place. Gospel for Asia has one in Texas. Francis Chan has one out in, you know, uh, California. I think I'm sure that, you know, Matt Chandler and David Platt, those guys. I mean, a lot of people that I look to as examples in my life, uh, there's these discipleship schools that are popping up. To, to just learn a little bit more about evangelism, to learn about, you know, having an intimate intimate relationship with the Father, uh, learn more about prayer. You know, a lot of stuff that should happen in the church, but it was it was a time just to get away from the world and just be focused uh, on, you know, on the Lord and, and let Him, you know, lead and guide me. So um, I would I would say that, you know, for young people, that would be a good um, a good thing to do and, and following and my footsteps or anyone else who feels called to go in missions, whether it be going to somewhere else in America or going overseas. Um, as far as, you know, the older generation, uh, God isn't done with, uh, you know, uh, the older generations of America or the world. There's still a lot of uh, work to do. Um, and I would just hope that they can be an encouragement to young people and that they can pick up someone to disciple, you know, um, if someone's going to church and that they are a uh, disciple of Jesus Christ, then they should be discipling someone. And it doesn't mean a, a casual, hey, let's go to breakfast once a month kind of thing. It should be uh, it should be a, a, a strong bond between them. They should be knowing what's going on in their lives. They should be able to call each other in prayer. And, and it, it should be 
there should be so much intimacy there that, you know, uh, the disciples should be able to hang out together and kind of sense what's going on in their life, even with, you know, things not being said. And, hey, are you okay? How can I pray for you? Or how are things going on? Let's praise the Lord for this or that. So I just, I wish that there would be more discipleship. And I say that from personal experience, because when I got saved when I was 15, there was a big lack of that discipleship, you know, that one-on-one, um, let's learn uh, together what God wants us to do uh, in our lives, and let's watch him uh, provide those opportunities, and then let's do it. Let's step out in faith, and uh, let's trust him and be obedient and, and yield to the Spirit and what he wants to do. And yeah, a lot of times it makes you uncomfortable, and a lot of times, you know, it's not something that you want to do, but um, he's growing us and stretching us, and I'm just learning that God's plan for all of our life in, in the Bible, it says uh, that he desires us to be sanctified. Um, so, you know, I think that God does want to use us to be able to, uh, you know, reach other people and, and show his love to them. But first it starts with us. It starts with looking at inward at our own heart and, and seeing if we're living in, 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 uh, in God's standard of what he said uh, in his word that we should be doing. Uh, and uh, it seems like a lot of people aren't taking it seriously that, uh, you know, Jesus said he came to serve, you know, and not be served. But a lot of people um, are are serving themselves, even in the church, you know. Um, and uh, it says that, you know, the, the world will know you by your love. A lot of people are not loving, uh, you know, their neighbors as themselves. Um, and, you know, just a lot of these, uh, a lot of these verses, you know, um, come to my mind, you know, like, uh, that don't really get preached at the pulpit when it talks about forsaking all for the gospel or counting all things as lost, uh, for Christ and, uh, you know, considering yourself to be crucified, um, so that he may live through you. I mean, you can go on and on and on about these verses that are very powerful, but I always have to look inward at my own heart daily as well to figure out, am I doing this? Am I actually, um, putting my faith into action, or am I deceived? Like John 1, uh, 22 says, um, it says, you can hear the Word of God and then do nothing. And, you know, I heard someone say uh, a few weeks back uh, that the enemy would love nothing more than for people to hear day in, and or week in and week out, even day in and day out, and then do nothing about it. Uh, you're harmless. You're harmless to him. And, uh, you know, you're, you're just pleasing yourself and fooling yourself. And that's what it says in, in James 1.22. It says that we can deceive ourselves. Um, so wearing a pretty cross and going to church uh, does not mean that you're a Christian. And there's scary verses in Scripture that talk about, you know, doing things in His name. You know, I don't know how I would feel if I stood before the living God in a few more days and said, I, I, pr- I performed these miracles and I did this and that. And God says, but I never knew you. You know, I think there's a lot of people that have that uh, that destiny, and it grieves my heart because I know the Father doesn't desire that. Uh, but people, our, our hearts are deceitful, you know, and uh, we're selfish, and uh, we need God's help desperately uh, to be able to help us love and serve and be obedient to His Word. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would... In general, if someone wants to uh, follow in the footsteps of Christ and sharing and showing his love, I think they have to first start with their own heart and start with the world around them. It doesn't make sense uh, for someone to go reach the world when they're not even reaching their next door neighbors, you know. So um, I would just challenge people to look inward at their own heart to see if they're be obedient, being obedient to God's word and, and that takes prayer and it takes a relationship with God because he's the one who's going to do it. It's not going to be in, in our own strength. So um, I would just say to start with your own heart and, and be honest with yourselves, just like we were when we first came to faith. We were like, wow, we, we realize this. We are wicked, evil sinners, and we desperately need a Savior. And it doesn't change when we become believers. We still desperately need Jesus, but a lot of us don't have that same uh, you know, desperate need. We think, oh, well, I, I accepted Christ. I said the prayer, so I guess I'm good. I got my golden ticket. I'm in heaven. You know, I'm, I'm fine. But, you know, I don't want to do the bare minimum, you know, and I don't, uh, I don't, I don't understand exactly how it's going to look when I stand before him. But 
you know, he gives us a glimpse into his uh, his glory, seeing the creation of this world, and uh, he talks about there being a new earth, you know, and new bodies and a new resurrected universe, and you know, we can see uh, a picture of heaven here uh, on earth if we wanna, really want to live that way and uh, have the joy uh, that the Lord wants to bring to our lives when we do that. So, yeah, I guess that was kind of a, a long, long way to talk about it. But My listeners, we are continuing our conversation with a missionary to North Korea. And for security reasons, we are just calling him Chart. Chart, is there anything more that you want to talk in this interview that you have not brought up? Um, yeah, you know, there was a couple things that God put on my heart to share when I came back. They're, they're really simple and quick, so I can, I can wrap it up. But um, uh, one, I, I mean, I've already talked a little bit about it, but I'll just reiterate it. Um, you know, uh, the first thing is that people say it's not safe in North Korea and uh, one of my first responses now is that, you know, uh, you know, did Jesus call us to be in safe places only? You know, the gospel didn't promise it to be safe, you know. Um, so I, I would say first that people don't let that be their standard. We're supposed to do God's will and we are supposed to trust him. Uh, but in reality, I think there's a big illusion when it comes to North Korea um, that the enemy has, you know, caused this big illusion and this distortion between America and North Korea, especially even in the church, that people, they spread this fear that it's not safe, it's not safe, it's not safe. But, you know, I know there was, the war was devastating uh, with, in, with Americans and Koreans. But, you know, since then today, there's not Americans getting killed left and right like there is in some other countries. Uh, uh, and with Christians uh, as well. So, I mean, as far as North Korea goes, I don't know what people's standard is of safety, but it's a very safe place. I've been there, and people kind of try to, you know, uh, you know, argue with me about it or uh, dispute over it. But I've been there, and I felt safer there than I do in most cities here in America. You know, it doesn't mean that I'm not completely at the mercy of the government. They can do whatever they want. That's true. But in general, you don't hear of people, Americans or foreign Christians, getting hurt over there. Now, yes, for local Christians, it's very dangerous for them. Uh, but technically, there's a freedom of religion over there, and I can bring my Bible in there. Um, they know I'm a Christian from the government uh, to the border with the military. Um, I, you can worship, you can pray openly, um, you can do all those things. A lot of people don't know that, um, but you can. But a lot of people think it's not safe. I would just pray that people would stop saying that about North Korea and about other countries because I feel like it hinders God's will. You know, they're, they're saying, this, is, this isn't safe, we shouldn't go there. You know, that's the number one thing that people say to me, man, what about, what about what God said about going? You know, what about the 24 million people who are, are, are uh, lost without Christ and they're dying without him and they don't know about his love? What about them? You know, we believe that we've been given eternal life. Do we really believe that? Do we really walk as though we believe that? Um, so sometimes that can be discouraging when I get that question over and over and over again, instead of, you know, yeah, we need, we, we should be more worried about the people who don't know about God's love, you know, like uh, I just wish that people would put it in its rightful place and being the most valuable thing that we have um, as Christians. Um, so, yeah, I would say just that people would not say that it's not safe anymore, that they would believe uh, God when he said that he'll be with them and he'll protect them if, if, if he wants to. Uh, but otherwise, um, you know, it'll be for his glory and gosh, we'll be with him uh, in eternity anyways. But right now it's safe. It's safe for people to go visit over there. Um, I've even invited my little sister and my little nephew. They're five and six now. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that if my, if my little nephews were going to get hurt, you know, but, um, when you're over there, you realize that that illusion is there and, uh, you can go visit, uh, you know, on just a tour there. Uh, you can go and visit a little bit longer term if you want to do a short project or you can go long term. The doors are, are opening there. 
so God is moving in mighty ways. It's just awesome to see his spirit moving, uh, and uh, it continues to get uh, more and more open there so they can keep praying uh, for that to happen and for more harvesters to be risen up uh, in this next generation to go. Um, the second thing is, uh, all these kind of relate with each other. Um, the second thing is, is to, um, I guess, not share that you're going to get arrested for sharing your faith. There's been a few people that have been arrested uh, for North, in North Korea for leaving a Bible or this or that, um, but you're not going to get arrested for talking about God, at least at this point. You know, maybe tomorrow or next week that would change, but once again, that shouldn't limit us to what God has called us to do. Um, but um, you're not going to get arrested for just talking about God over there. Handing out a Bible track or a Bible, um, yeah, it's it's a tangible thing that they consider like an act of terrorism in their in their government. Because it's a communist country, you're indirectly saying that you have more authority than the government when you physically hand out something tangible. Um, so uh, at some point, that line's got to get crossed, so I don't know how all of that looks. Um, but I'm willing to take the risk if that's what God wants me to do, and other people should be willing to also if we really care uh, about the lives of these people the way that God cares about them. Um, the last thing I would share is just, um, like I said before, that people wouldn't spread fear, that they would believe the God who created all the universe, that it's already done as he's promised it, that he's going to reach these people, and that we would just have much more hope and faith and love uh, for these people, and uh, we wouldn't be cursing them, you know, by saying, oh, no, it's so dangerous, and they're wicked people, and they're the government, and this and that, and whatever. Like, some people say it's just the government we hate, and it's not the people, but, you know, there's a convicting theme verse that a friend of mine shared with me, and it's, uh, I think it's Luke 6.35, and it talks about loving your enemy, doing good to them, and expecting nothing in return. That's, that's an amazing statement. When you take that into heart, someone can meditate on that for weeks to think about what it is to love your enemies, do good to them, and expect nothing in return. Um, so that includes the government. That includes the military. That includes the leader, Kim Jong-un. That includes Obama. That includes our government, you know? Um, and I think when we start living according to God's Word the way that He desires, then uh, we can see... Uh, his glory, we can be in uh, the fullness of fellowship with him, and we can experience all, all the peace and blessing and joy that flows from that. So, um, you know, that, that last one was just that people wouldn't spread fear and instead spread hope and love to be looking at their own hearts and, and making sure that their hearts are right first with these people and repenting if it's necessary, uh, forgiving if it's necessary, whatever is necessary to get your own heart right and then express to others uh, about uh, how God feels about these people and the way that we should also feel about them. Um, so God has promised to reach them. Uh, we're not limited by the things of this world. God uh, is much more powerful, uh, and he's promised to reach them. He loves them, and he's going to. So um, it's exciting to be a part of that. Um, if, uh, if anybody wanted to learn more, um, you know, about going there. Uh, I have friends there that they can visit as Christians to visit other Christians there, and it's completely open. Like I said, it's not a hidden thing. It's a very open thing. I wish uh, that CNN would show that kind of thing, but they don't. Uh, but they can email me if they wanted to visit there, go there short-term, long-term. Uh, my email address that they can email me at is ewchart, C-H-A-R-T, at outlook.com. Um, again, that's E-W-C-H-A-R-T at Outlook.com. And if anybody was interested in, in helping support, supporting me or, or they, they felt uh, uh, a call to be able to join what God is doing there and partner with me and what God's been doing there for a long time, uh, they can go on uh, the sending ministry of mine. It's called East West Ministries, but the website is eastwest.org, and they can just go to the missionaries, and they can go to chart. Uh, my name there. It's going to be very secure. You won't see a picture of me. You won't see any bio of me. Um, but if they want to give uh, and be a part of that, then they can uh, donate there. If they email me, um, then I can try to put them on my newsletter list to where they can get uh, more detail. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just excited uh, and eager to go back uh, and see what God does. He's continuing to reveal more and more as I walk by faith. Uh, but uh, he's going to do it. 
Uh, he's done it all along, and he'll continue to. So um, I just feel privileged to be able to daily um, have a relationship with him and want to take that deeper and deeper, spending time with the Father. And everything else is just kind of bonus uh, and being able to, to reach and uh, share his love. So um, it's a blessing to to meet you. You know, even when we met, it was exactly how God has been working for the last three years as I'm completely surrendered and, and, and sold out to him and trying to love him with all my heart and my mind and my strength and put him on the the throne of my heart in his rightful, worthy place in my life. And, you know, when we met, I remember driving past there and your church and I just remember driving in there. I was like, I don't even know why I'm here. We had never met. I'd never even been there. And I just kind of wandered in the back door and in there and I opened up a door and you guys were all having a prayer meeting. And then I was like, Hey, you guys like, Hey, come on in here. And then, you know, who would have known what God would have done, but that's exactly how he's worked. And, you know, uh, I've noticed that, you know, it's, it's the, uh, small groups that God has been using. It's the, it's the weak, uh, uh, feeble people that recognize that Christ is the one that's supposed to show himself strong in us, uh, that God uses. So, uh, a lot of us, you know, have uh, a lot of repenting to do and, and breaking to do to, 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 to be humble and let God do the work in us. And, uh, you know, we're so strong a lot of the times. I think that prayer and fasting is a, a necessary thing, not out of obligation or legalism or any of that, but uh, it's just a way to, to put your flesh in its rightful place as just weak and, and desperate need of God. And, um, you know, he shows up when, uh, you know, when we desperately desire uh, his spirit to rule and reign in our daily lives. So um, just been an awesome journey. So I'm excited to see how things uh, blossom and unfold from here. Excellent. Well, sir, thank you for the interview. My privilege. You want to give that to your email address one more time? Yeah. Yeah. The email address, if anyone wanted a uh, newsletter or, or a visit or short-term, long-term uh trips uh it is e w c h a r t at outlook dot com um so yeah it was such a blessing to meet you and uh I'm honored to be able to be on here to be able to share uh, a little bit on behalf of those people and God's heart for these people so God is going to keep on moving mightily and uh the times are short um so I'm excited to uh you know continuing to uh, seek the Lord and see what he does in my own heart and my own life and uh, what he does through me. And uh, just a few more days we'll be with him and it'll all, it'll all make sense. It'll all be uh, glorious and it'll all be, we'll see that it's been worth it all along. So. All right, my listeners, this is Reverend Thomas Wise. I've been interviewing a missionary to North Korea. This is the back end. So catch the front end uh, on my, the YouTube channel called Politically Wise. So, by God's grace, uh, we'll you'll you'll be blessed like I've been blessed by this young man, encouraged and challenged. Again, this is Reverend Thomas Wise, and the show is called Politically Wise. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Thank you for listening today. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Please like us on our Facebook page, Politically Wise. Now, here's your blessing. Blessings based on Psalms chapter 24, verses 6 through 10. Wake up and be ready to be blessed. Who will bless you? the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty. He is ready to bless you. Allow him to enter in with you so you will know his great blessing. Allow the King of glory to bless you.